Nah. Draft physics video production. Yes, it is. <laughs> Lucky you. Anyway, particles. Might be able to see them subtly. Um, anyway, um, so I can draw here. <clears throat> um, I was linked to this AWW app dot com. It's a, <clears throat> I've used a drawing program before, but this one seems to work better, so it might work for drawing and save me the trouble of markers and glare and all of that crap. So, I might go with that in the future. See how it goes. So, photons. Sort of the subject. Not too, you know, the comments are just crap, so we'll save them for some other fun day. Uh, anyway, um, uh, crap, I mean, some varieties of the crap is just useless and just such a waste of time. Uh, I mean, there are real subjects here, and it just surprises me that the trolls, you know, can't even get close to one of them. They can't even write, like, some little paragraph defending whatever it is they believe in. Nothing. But anyway, <clears throat> um, so... Photons. So, uh, on the subject, thinking about photons, talking about them, um, you know, there is this idea. So, I've so I pointed out the polarization of photons. So, if we just let's just say we're going to make the frequency, and the idea is, is that these little bits, the quanta of the energy, however you want to look at it, the wave, uh, it doesn't matter, is say somewhere in the range of four to five hundred nanometers for the average piece of light and you know that means this here distance is uh, you know 400 nanometers the polarization however you want to visualize it uh, and an atom is not very big okay so it might be 0.3 you know nanometers and the electron, wherever it may be located at any particular time, because it doesn't know where it is, uh, the photons effectively have to probably hit that, right? I mean, it makes sort of sense. Um, and that's got to be really a tiny amount of space. And so how does all of this interact with a single atom? doesn't seem very likely. Uh, you know, so it's got to react with more than one, and, you know, it's sort of a dilemma, you know, a weird circumstance. So, let's just back up. I guess that's the easiest way to erase. Anyway, um, all right, so uh, I was thinking about that, and just photons, and then the whole phase shift thing. And maybe I should come up with a way to make a dot uh, better. Maybe I just make this thick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, there's a dot. You can see that probably. Um, so I was thinking about the, the idea that the phase gets shifted. So you have these dots in an order. Um, and you call that a photon. Just pretend they're all the same distance this way. You know, horizontally away from each other. That's the frequency, that's the thing that we see. And to see, we have to see like six of those. And a uh, frog maybe can see four, you know, and, then, and see that photon. But we need a certain ray length, as I've pointed out. I think that one's a pretty secure statement. You can believe it. Um, or not. Anyway. Um, Alright, so I was thinking of the cosmic background radiation and the redshift and you know there's just these kind of obvious numbers you know where you have uh, the frequency the distance the period between the little dots uh, for um, infrared light we'll just here we'll do this first ultraviolet light would be say 250 and uh, well, yeah, drawing the numbers is a little bit of a waste of time um, and the number for the red light is something like whatever. We could just say 700 for fun or 750. It just doesn't matter. But the idea would be is that there is this coincidental kind of doubling of the number. You could make this 300 and you can make this 650. It just doesn't really matter. It's like close to a double of the number. So what would happen theoretically um, if somebody was to, say, move this 
photon or this photon because they're out here in the outer banks. Um, and I think I can actually move things if I select them. Huh, let's see. Uh, it didn't seem to do anything. Let's see if this does something. Uh, yeah, that seems to do something. Let's see if I can. Nope, can't move it though. Got to figure out how to do that, I guess. But anyway, we can just erase for now and put them back. Element eraser. Okay, let's see how that works. It didn't erase that element. It didn't do a damn thing. All right, so we won't do that. There, we'll just erase that one and erase that one. And so they got phase shifted, which means we put them in a different position. It means they end up here. Uh, I gotta put that stool back on. Oh, I don't want to do all that. Yes, 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 yes. Fine, 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 fine. Oh, I don't want it over there. All right, so I do have to learn how to use this. So if that one got moved over here, and theoretically the one that was here got moved over here, what you end up with is a change in the frequency. Um, you know, just happens to turn out that way. This is weird. This menu doesn't do me any good at all. I can't get rid of it. Ah, there. Hit it twice. Alright. And then I'll learn how to erase. So, the point is, is now I've essentially, right, doubled the frequency here. I've taken something that was 250, that was bluish, and I've converted it, essentially, into reddish, just by picking off a couple of its elements and phase shifting them you know, uh -huh, 90 degrees. So I have theorized, um, you may remember, uh, let's just use green, that uh, there are these little atoms, uh, so I'm writing again, and I hit it twice, okay. So there would be these little helium and hydrogen atoms in space and that they're transparent, you know, that the light goes right through them, essentially, because they're little transparent atoms. But we know that nothing goes through something like that. It doesn't just go through empty space in the atom or some kind of crap like that. That it interacts with it and gets readmitted in some form. Like electricity. It's converted into something else for a little while and then it's readmitted. So the concept would be is that this essentially equals a phase shift. So when a photon goes through a little atom in space it is phase shifted. Uh, the quanta, whatever little bits of quanta. So the idea would be is that the photon comes in having a certain dimension. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, because of its polarization. Uh, it's very big polarization. So its elements are coming in, as, you know, this is exaggerate the distance here by a lot. Okay, and so certain elements of the photon go through the atom. They're phase shifted, that is their positions are moved. So this one was moved from here to here, and this one was moved from here to here. And by just doing that, you change blue light into red light. And that's why the all the stuff, the further away it is in space, the more red shifted it is because the blue light that it was producing Right, the exact opposite of the red has now been some percentage of it has been converted into red light merely through a phase shift and a, a tiny little minor thing it went through a transparent atom or a clump of atoms it might take a clump of them who knows uh, but phase shifts happen every time in many cases with any thin film uh, you always get phase shifts going in and going out, or going in and reflecting, I think is how it works. But regardless, you, lots of phase shifting happens. And so it's perfectly consistent with that. Um, the coincidental circumstance, that it's pretty easy to imagine how you can do this conversion um, in terms of it's really easy to slow down bits of a photon by slow down, again, I mean, not that the photon slows down, but that the phase shift is really just a consequence of understanding that, let's say there was a little electron here, that the photon hits the electron, changes its momentum, changes its 
but you could say position in the atom to a new position and that that takes a certain amount of time because the electron moves much slower than the speed of light and that accounts for the phase shift you've changed its position uh, I would argue it goes back again and creates the <clears throat> you know something else <laughs> that leaves but regardless um, unless it's transmitting it so it's just like you just have to follow the bouncing ball here in in the sense that just following the energy but it's understanding what do you think's happening when energy is is being transferred when you're causing acceleration when you're interacting with something um, you know uh, the, what is in a reflection is an absorption and then a readmission um, or is it something else more complicated uh, does it just bounce off the surface or does it interact with the surface I would argue it must interact and uh, <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah it's just more complicated um, but anyway um, so I think another uh, hypothesis worthy of consideration as an explanation and it's so simple and now we can get rid of all this silly talk about expansion and contraction I mean the universe doing this and doing that and you know all the pile of crap they have piled on this stupid redshift problem and it could be as simple as this there end of the redshift problem the universe is back to being boring and uh, regular <laughs> you know and uh, yeah just so much better so um, there are other photon subjects so I think I'll move along to them I guess we just delete this yes please it just, you know it works nice I mean I guess it just I mean yes I hit the button so go ahead and do it uh, anyway this is really cool in the sense that <clears throat> more than one person can draw on this and I was thinking man this would be pretty good in a live room but you have to pay you know to have control over what people do because obviously if you had it in a live room people would just keep clearing the page see they don't put no clear buttons is too dangerous <laughs> but anyway uh, but you know people just post you know rude images and all kinds of crap and probably won't go anywhere but it would be entertaining I suppose as a active way for people to chat <laughs> you know chat by image exchanges and other kinds of nonsense but anyway uh, I digress uh, all right so the other problem I have talked about uh, yes I would like to draw is the interferometer and um, so you should be able to draw a quick view of it uh, We'll just put a source over here, let's say. All right. And we probably should draw it in a different color. So the idea is, is you have what they call a beam splitter, right? But there's no good description of exactly how this thing accomplishes the task of beam, beam splitting. So we probably should um, redraw that in some form or another. Um, but anyway, the idea is, is the... The beam of light is, well, I probably should have done this the other way, but it doesn't really matter, is one part of it is reflected and one part is transmitted. So the reflected part, they bounce off another mirror, let's see here, and uh, send it someplace interesting, I suppose. Uh, let it bounce around some more times. Uh, we'll get back to that later. Um, <laughs> and uh, the other beam, uh, colors. I'll figure out how to do this without the extra bit. Okay, and the other half of the beam goes through and uh, likewise has to hit a mirror of some kind. So I guess we'll draw a mirror of some kind. Uh, right. And hits a mirror. So the mirrors look like beam splitters, but that'll have to do. Uh, maybe we'll make the lines smaller, and then we can uh, draw the back path smaller. All right, so it goes back. This one ref 
flex, right? It's supposed to anyway. And so the green one's doing the same thing. I probably drew this wrong. <laughs> yeah, you probably did. Uh, having them go the same direction is probably a mistake also. It just kind of destroys the whole point of it. All right, so this one should just reflect back. Yeah, that's just make it easy. Uh, no, I don't want to clear that much. Just get rid of this. I should have made this a bigger eraser. All right, well, there is some time wasted here, I have to concede. All right, so... <laughs> you know, that's not a very good all right not a very good job of erasing but you, know, you get the idea all right and so this one just let's just move well let's fix it all right let's just fix it here all right. let's fix it asshole all right all right so that should be able to erase this better oh, if you need an even bigger eraser all right and this mirror is the wrong way and it's the wrong color so we'll get rid of that all right now we'll change this back to black and make a proper mirror Uh, it's not a proper mirror because it's not thick enough, but anyway, you get the idea of mirror. All right, so it hits the mirror, and the little green bit comes back, goes through the mirror this time, the beam splitter. And so then you have these two beams that are supposed to be interfering with each other, and then they create the classic uh, pattern of rings. Um, now, as I pointed out, a piece of glass with dirt on it will also create this pattern. And the beam splitter is really a half-silvered mirror, so the idea of usually, generally speaking, something like that. Um, or else they use a, a diffraction grade, a, a thin film that is essentially a bunch of lines in all kinds of directions to scatter in a way the light. Uh, diffracted. All right, so anyway, so the general idea is here. Okay, so the light's taking two different paths, <clears throat> and this little tiny difference in the path length, where they're arguing they're measuring one half the thickness of a proton. So they put these two beams together, and one of them is lagging, you know, it's out of phase by one half of a proton, and they're saying that's what's causing this pattern. And it's causing the pattern to blip out, blip on, blip off here in the middle. So the pattern is constantly cycling. So the middle will go from being a solid to being clear to being a solid to being a clear. And the rings will all change positions. And uh, they say that's measuring the wavelength of a photon. Um, now a fairly small distance. And that's you know, depending on how much it blips on and off, uh, would be smaller sections of uh, measurement. So it's a kind of a bold statement. Uh, Proton is really small. I mean, if atoms are half of a nano, if an atom is, you know, uh, three, one third of a nanometer, <laughs> you know, so the proton's a little tiny thing in the nucleus. It's, you know, it's an insanely small distance they're claiming to be able to measure. Now, um, so I don't see anything in this, you know, the statement of the theory that makes any sense. And what I have argued is when you have a, a, a half silvered mirror, you essentially are creating a bunch of little slits. And the little slits aren't in rows like this, they're in just all over the place. The, the little dots of mirror are scattered different sizes different shapes different surfaces so the light is being it's doing the classic single slit thing okay where it's going through and it's in a sense creating pattern all over the place in terms of an interference pattern in all kinds of locations but the key thing is is it's the light is diffracting in the sense it's separating it's spreading. It's getting spread. So the overall beam, as it goes through, is you know the beam that the beam that goes through the half silver and doesn't hit the silver. That beam of light through this whole path will be spreading. 
and that spread will get reflected off the mirror and it'll continue to spread in this direction. So by the time it gets to the, uh, the beam splitter again, this beam has been spreading. That is the lights being spread out. And this beam didn't spread because it hit the silver and the silver doesn't cause spreading. Now whether this silver creates a phase shift is another question, but anyway, that they they attempt to compensate for by putting a dummy piece of glass in between one of the paths. But anyway, but this beam is clearly not spreading. It's not didn't go through slits, so it doesn't have any reason to be diffracted. So it's still intact through its. And these two paths are the same length. Just imagine that. Imagine the mirrors down here where it's supposed to be. Anyway, so it bounces back and it's not spreading and it doesn't spread till this very end so it goes this little bit of distance spreading so this beam the purple one has spread huge this one's only spread a little tiny bit and i'd say that's how this thing functions that's why the patterns are weird and that there's no interaction between the different groups of photons besides the interaction you could get if there was phase shifts and, and there are phase shifts through this whole process and then again you're kind of screwing with the photons in the sense that you're changing their their order their <clears throat> and by doing that maybe some of this light is combining with this light in the sense that you've broken their phases equally and those photons end up making essentially new photons so you kind of break the old photons and then combine their pieces to make some new piece of energy. So anyway, that's uh, one interpretation. Um, I'm just saying there's no, I can't tell you what their theory is because they won't draw you a diagram explaining what their theory is or how it works. Or because if I put a single photon in, their theory kind of says the single photon will take both paths. Now they haven't ever proven that. <laughs> you know, or demonstrated in any way. Um, so we're just left with who knows. Um, I don't know. So if you have any information about where somebody did the single photon experiment with an interferometer, I'd be very interested. So anyway, um, my point being, it's mirrors, right? So these mirrors are a whole nother subject. How does light reflect off of a mirror? Uh, you know, how deep into the mirror does it go? Uh, you know, what's what's the process of reflection? So, if you know, if you just make a mirror, a surface, and you make it as flat as you can, and all of that stuff, are you still keeping all the protons exactly in the same position? Like every single proton is at exactly the same latitude and longitude, so to speak, exactly dimensionally in exactly the same space, and exactly lined up with each other so that every single photon bounces off the same place, I mean the same exact location in space. Because the theory is they're relying on a little tiny bit of movement in this mirror, right, to measure this vibration that space causes. Um, and well, if your photons you know, if this one hits off this area and the next one goes in this deep and then it reflects, right? I mean, if your reflections are happening from different depths of the material, uh, you know, that's, that's going to make it pretty impossible for you to say, I measured a tiny, tiny little movement less than a proton in this mirror when, you know, the mirror itself has a depth that's, you know, hundreds or thousands of times more irregular than the distance you're claiming to measure. And that's on top of the fact that, you know, in the LIGO experiment, this interferometer doesn't just bounce the light off a mirror and send it back. It bounces it off uh, 1,600 times. Well, 1,800, I think. Okay, so 800. So it bounces it off the surface 800 times, what ends up being 1,600 well, you, you can sort of get it, something like that. It ends up being 1,600 impacts with a mirror. 1,600, you know, before they let it go back through. So who knows what technology, what magic technology they're using. 
to be able to turn this mirror off. So essentially the light goes through, somehow they trap it inside the interferometer, make it bounce back and forth 1600 times, and then collect it. And obviously I think to make it go back and forth, it has to go back and forth in this kind of pattern, right? It's going back and forth, like they shoot it through a little hole in the mirror, right? You could argue there's a little hole in the center of the mirror and they shoot it through at an angle and so then it bounces off the surface and bounces and bounces and bounces and bounces and then they collect it over here. So all of these angles aren't straight lines either. Uh, so <laughs> you're now adding even more distance based on how many times you bounce it. And they have to bounce both sides 1600 times. Okay, so both wings are bouncing 1600 times and the expectation is that somehow after all of that crap you're going to measure half the distance of a proton in the difference between how they bounced. That there's some way you can do that. That, is, that makes logical sense. And I'd say, no, nah, I'm not even close. But no one talks about it. So we're all just supposed to assume they have some brilliant theory that makes that what seems to be pretty much impossible, that with all the noise of the thickness of the mirrors, with all the noise you're creating by creating all these little angles of reflection with all that noise that somehow in all that noise you're still seeing a tiny tiny change in this mirror now that just seems ludicrous on its face <laughs> there's no way that can work right no way all right all right so i'll switch to a science asylum video i guess and uh uh, yeah, am I recording anyway? I just thought I'd better check. <laughs> yeah, it appears to be. Alright. Uh, I'd be back. Yeah, I should be back. There was a comment in the comments that was semi-related to this, so maybe I'll go to that. So anyway, this is a little thing on mirrors, and, you know, I don't dispute much of the physics, but some of it is stupid. <laughs> some of the statements are stupid. But anyway, uh, but the important part is just it points out how there is a bunch of theory about how deep light goes into a surface before it reflects, and that's the important part relevant to the interferometer, mirrors in the interferometer, and how that's kind of a function of the silver, and there's no magic uh, that you can apply where you can just pretend it's not a real issue that you can't predict ahead of time what an individual photon is going to do in terms of how far it's going to penetrate the surface that it's going to reflect off of. But anyway, um, so one of the comments. I might as well read the other ones too. Uh, gravity can be analogized as a higher dimensional push in the curled up fifth dimension of space. It's just absolute crap. I mean, so it says you. I mean, um, you can make mathematical equations where, sure, the math creates fantasy lands where you can exchange things with fantasy land. So you can send your garbage to fantasy land and pretend there's no environmental impact because you sent it to fantasy land. I mean, it's, it's you know, yes, it's mathematical mush. It, there's no reason to believe there's fifth or fourth or any of these extra dimensions. You wish to indulge in that kind of fantasy, then go ahead and waste your time, but don't do it here. I'm arguing with conventional theory, okay? Not the fifth dimensional kind of conventional theory, you know, not the fringe loonies. Fuck. Uh, Mr. Keebler, howdy Gary, do you have a ham radio license? Well, I figure I'll answer the question, no. I ask only because a lot of what you go over here, some of the answers to questions on the test, yes. And he thinks I would do very well on the test and blah, blah, blah. Well, I should do adequately on it because, yeah, frankly, I've gone to a lot of physics lectures, so to speak. All right, so this is completely almost incomprehensible gibberish, but let's see. Why bother changing your signal into photons at the antenna? Well, because they're not exactly the same thing. See, I'd, I'd love to just say, oh yeah, photons travel through a wire, and uh, then photons pop out of antennas. But the point is, is they are fundamentally different. Like a piece of glass just illustrates it, right? I mean, you can send photons through it, things at a frequency, 
but you can't send electricity through it. Even when that's at a frequency, you can't get it through there. I mean, unless you turn it into um, really high energy stuff. But uh, it doesn't transmit, okay, uh, low frequency well at all. Um, and like electricity, it doesn't transmit it. It's an insulator. So there's clearly a subtle difference. Now, obviously, it's all stuff kind of trying to go with the speed of light. And the whole argument about this phase shift stuff is, is it tries to go with the speed of light, but if it has to interact with matter, the matter moves more slowly, subtly, but more slowly. And that when you optimize, though, that interaction between atoms, you can get it back to almost the speed of light. So, you know, if you have a very good conductor, okay, that's very efficient in doing this transferring, it's almost as if photons are traveling through the wire is they're having so little uh, slowing down. There's so little um, getting in their way. But then if I just send light through a piece of glass, it's slowed down in the sense it's obviously having to do a lot of slower interactions that are kind of like electrical, but they're not obviously a straight path. Something gets in the way. The electricity doesn't just go. It's like a lightning bolt. It you know, takes this jagged path that just makes it take more time to get through. So that's why, I mean, the whole point of, I argued about changing the frequency in the sense that you want to peak your frequency, have it, if you, get, if you can pulse your energy very efficiently. So instead of having a thick pulse of, of energy, if you can make it thinner and thinner, like a sharper pulse, higher, sharper, um, that you can probably reduce the amount of polarization, that is, confine your photons to a narrower beam and in some ways overcome some of the limitations of your energy as it's produced. You can enhance your radar and that kind of thing. Uh, just say that it is what you stated with electromagnetic energy. So again, it just you're just denying the subtleties that do exist. So you want to pretend it's, you want to say, look, I'm saying it's one thing, force. I'm saying there's only one force. But clearly, how the force gets from point A to point B really depends on what you're shoving in between point A and point B. So you can say it's the same thing, but it doesn't really behave as the same thing because it's doing something different. It's having to um, interact with matter, and when it interacts with matter, it's not exactly doing the same thing. Uh, just there's, There are subtle truths. You want to pretend they don't exist? Fine. All right, at the same, okay, electromagnetic energy and that same signal left your antenna. So again, it, nothing happens instantaneously. Uh, so, and this whole point is, is that that little subtle, subtle changes in hat timing make all the difference in terms of what the outcome is. So if the light is um, uh, coming at a higher frequency, it tips something over. If it comes at a slower frequency, it doesn't tip it over. You know, and getting to harmonics and resident frequencies and, you know, adding energy versus subtracting energy from systems. I'm just saying you're just pretending all of that can go away and we can just say it's just photons. Well, it's, it's just not. All right, anyway, an SWR, whatever the hell that is, meter, is going to help you with sloppy antenna. So this is just I didn't say the antenna was sloppy. I'm saying the polarization is a kind of ray sloppiness. You're just saying that something isn't in a confined space when it's moving, right? So it's not the antenna's fault. As I was pointing out, it's the signal's fault. Uh, PS 96.4%. And that's helpful how, whatever that is. How, how close to the speed of light electricity travels, or what, what's that number mean? So thanks, but no thanks. Uh, if you can't interact on a little bit higher level, <laughs> okay, uh, forget it. It's not useful. P.S. 96.4. Fuck you. That crap. If you have an argument to make, make it in some sort of more coherent form. Eesh. So anyway, so that's sort of on the subject. <laughs> yeah, okay. So now back to the subject of mirrors and what, a, what essentially is a reflection. 
So I just play a little bit at the beginning. But so does this piece of paper. What's the difference? Why aren't they the same? I actually get this question a lot in the comments. All right, let's go back to the beginning. Hey, crazies. This mirror reflects all visible light. Okay, so that's sort of a bogus statement right there because mirrors don't reflect all the light. I mean, they have an efficiency. And so maybe they've made a mirror that reflects every single photon. It doesn't destroy a single one. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. don't think so. <laughs> so the statement is misleading at best. Well, see, that question is kind of stupid because that one's so obvious. I mean, it's the texture thing and the angles, and you're just, you know, the light doesn't reflect off paper in a straight back. It's being reflected off too many surfaces and heading in too many directions and all of that crap. So that one doesn't do you much good. So let's get through all this horse shit of his ads and his Patreon pukers. Right. Gives you the illusion you're looking through a window into some mirror universe. Paper is a little different. With paper, the light scatters instead. It spreads out, so we call it diffuse light. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why he doesn't just point out because the paper is an insanely irregular surface. But whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> all right, and so then, the, you know, it goes into the stupid Huygens crap, all this other crap that doesn't really, no, 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 no. All the, <clears throat> so this part is again the mirror has a consistent reflection I want to get to the depth part because see there's the lumpy surface of the paper so he gets it right there let's see <clears throat> and it doesn't but it's definitely part of the explanation I mean all of us can tell this smooth piece of plastic is not a mirror but it definitely has some mirror like effects it's just not the whole explanation there must be something else going on hmm we're gonna have to go deeper, like literally deeper into the material. So so. The mirrored surface is made of atoms, usually silver or some other shiny metal. We like to imagine that light interacts with the atoms on top, but there are spaces between those atoms that the light can fit through. Scattering can happen off many. Right. So this is another part of this these this whole perception. So when physics wants to, it'll admit that there's these atoms and they're in these this ordered geometry. And then, like, people like Richard Feynman will say, well, how does the bottom surface know what the top surface is doing? Well, the bottom surface is, a, is just like that. It has to contain the atoms. So if you have this rigid geometry with, within the atoms, that is, they're a certain distance from each other, and I would argue because of the realities of polarization, they never line up this way. They line up, you know, uh, scattered. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, too bad I can't draw on top of it. Um, but they would, each row would <clears throat> be more like a, a, a diamond shape than the square shape in the sense that they would line up uh, to, a, to be balanced pressure between them in uh, a polarization kind of sense. Um, the magnets have to be uh, plus to minus, plus to minus. So they won't be able to line up like this because then they'd repel each other too much and they couldn't get very close to each other and all that crap. So they have to complement each other. But anyway, the point w which would make the, t the top surface irregular and make the bottom surface have a certain irregularity. Um, but anyway, you know, you can just, by obvious, if I make this, if I say, the surface has, I'm going to polish the surface, and so this bottom surface has to be this, this line right here. So I could just make an arbitrary line somewhere. Well, obviously, these atoms can only fit so many lengthwise, so they're going to adjust their position based on how thick I allow them to exist in, how much thickness I allow them to exist in. They're going to adjust their position to fit in the amount of surface, the amount of space I'm allowing them. So if I'm polishing the glass and I'm making it shorter, smaller, and smaller, smaller space, they're going to realign to that space. And that's why, of course, they're going to reflect light differently. They're going to um, absorb light differently. Likewise. And the bottom surface for the top surface. Layers of atoms. Likewise. And still contribute to the Ooh. reflected light. 
That's the mirror-like reflection in this plastic is from the surface atoms. Eesh. The color is from the layers. Better of not pause anymore. And that's not even considering the wave nature of light. If we do that, each of those atoms sends out its own light in all directions, including into the material. Ultimately, those light waves cancel, except in two specific directions. You heard me right. The incoming beam splits in two at any surface. It doesn't have to be transparent. Some of the light will reflect. We call that the reflected light for obvious reasons. The rest will move forward into the new material. We call that the transmitted or refracted light. Right. How much is reflected and transmitted? So that's the silly part, right? The, the individual photons don't do that. What happens is some portion, some percentage of them hit certain locations and go in, and certain photons hit different locations and don't go in. So the whole way he's describing it again, if you know, they turn into this wave nature so they can turn one photon into five million photons, and then make statements about what five million photons do instead of making a statement about what an individual single photon does. So he draws a single photon and then talks about it as if it was five million photons and that's where people just lose all sight of the truth here but anyway I just wanted this for the value of pointing out that they're conceding the photon could be reflecting off the depth of the material and it could be 20 or 30 atoms deep and so we're talking again about you know 20 or 30 atoms is uh, thousands of nanometers <laughs> you know and so how could how could you have that much variability in your interferometer and then claim you can see the thickness of a f proton's difference in your two beams seems ludicrous on its face I don't know somebody have some explanation for how that can work uh, and such <clears throat> so anyway enough of a statement and uh, since the video is about to crash uh, yeah, we'll call it a video. So, till the next time and such. See, I, well, I talked about this, the idea of the redshift being a consequence of hitting atoms and light being slowed down and since the frequency would be changed because the atoms would tend to be moving towards the photons, the ones they hit, and that that energy was going to change the frequency of the photons over time. So I was... I was sort of on the right track, but I had the wheels backwards. So, um, recognizing the phase shift, yeah, you know, does does answer the question nicely. <laughs> but we'll see. There'll be critics who'll say no, it can't be, but they won't explain why it can't be.